From awaytogarden.com and robinhoodradio.com, this is A Way to Garden with Margaret Roach. Your weekly invitation to dig in A neighbor and grow. with a new cold frame emailed me the other day, seeing colder weather finally in the forecast and wanting to know how to extend his season even longer inside the unit. Well, serendipitously, later that day, I went to the post office and found a review copy of Nikki Jabor's new book, Growing Undercover, waiting for me, and had some answers for my neighbor. Today's topic is cold frames, but first, these messages. Programming and underwriting support from Garden Tool Company. Garden Tool Company's wide selection of heirloom quality, quality tools for your gardening passion is backed by outstanding customer service, fast shipping, and ongoing support. GardenToolCompany.com. Programming and underwriting support from Brushwood Nursery. For more than 20 years, Brushwood Nursery has shipped the finest selection of clematis and other vines all over the United States with full gallon size plant and free shipping. Their website is full of beautiful pictures and information on growing clematis. BrushwoodNursery.com. Despite living in Nova Scotia, writer Nikki Jabor is a year-round vegetable gardener, coaxing harvests out of every manner of season-extending device imaginable, from cloche to full-on polytunnel. She's the award-winning author of books that include Veggie Garden Remix and The Year-Round Vegetable Gardener, and she's back today to talk cold frames, one of the tactical approaches in her newest book, Growing Undercover, a book that helps us not just lengthen the season, but also outsmart pests and increase productivity. Hi, Nikki. I need all of those things. (laughs) (laughs) Hey, Margaret. Great to talk to you again. Yes. um, (laughs) Happy winter. Happy year of madness. (laughs) It, indeed, that's probably the best description. I hope you're writing a book called that that we can expect to come out next year. <laughs> yes, I'm working on it. Um, and and so we'll, I should say, of course, we'll have a book giveaway on with the transcript of the show on awaytogarden.com of your new book. I don't know how you managed to get this done um, in addition to everything else. <laughs> You know what? I don't know, honestly, Um, but it was really fun to write and and sort of revisit the whole season extending as well as, you know, the many other reasons besides, you know, harvesting in cold weather. Um, So, yeah, this was a fun project for me, for sure. Kept me busy. And it really is, again, as I said in the introduction, not just season extending, but it's like insect prevention. It's like all of the uses for these sort of barriers and enclosures and so forth, right? And there's a wide range of of gizmos that you have. <laughs> yeah, you know, gizmos is an underrated word. I'm going to have to steal that from you, Margaret, okay. and start using that one. Um, yeah, for sure. I mean, I garden in Nova Scotia, uh, which is deer country, as is, of course, much of the U.S. and Canada. And I deal with deer every single day. I mean, I went out for a run in my neighborhood yesterday and had to stop to let four deer walk across the road in front of me. Um, <laughs> And they were probably on their way to my garden, Uh, you know, but yeah, everything from deer and groundhogs to rabbits to cabbage worms and slugs uh, and flea beetles and and potato beetles and cucumber beetles. So there are a lot of reasons to consider covers. I think most people automatically go to season extension and protecting from cold weather. But, you know, I use them in so many different ways to not only protect my food from pests and cold weather, but to even grow healthier plants and in the end have a larger harvest because those plants have been protected, um, you know, and they're able to produce better. So there are a lot of reasons to sort of consider yourself an undercover gardener. Right. So in the introduction, I also said I was asking questions for a friend (laughs) Oh, yes, my friend. You know how that is when you ask questions (laughs) for a friend. Seriously, I actually do have a friend who just built cold frames. This is his first late fall and into winter with them. And he actually did ask me the question I said, but um, that is the oldest disguise in the book also. (laughs) So I have loads of cold frame questions for me, too, besides the extra extending of the season in in, in them. And we'll get there. But because build a cold frame is actually the number one thing on the top of my 2021 garden to-do list because I had an ancient one that succumbed finally, you know, kind of fall, fell apart yep. <laughs> And for my early years as a gardener here. And I never replaced it. And I'm just jealous, especially this last year, you know, I've been jealous of my friends who have them and they're saying, oh, I have my seedlings in the cold frame. Oh, I'm having salad from the cold frame. You know, all these little mm-hmm. extra goodies. So, so cold frame 101 Maybe we should start with like what what is a cold frame for? Like why would I choose yeah. that? Because there's all again all these other 
gizmos <laughs> in the book to use our new favorite word. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Well, you know, I, I'm glad you brought up also starting seedlings in the cold frame because most of us, I think at this point, think cold frames are just for harvesting in winter or maybe pushing back spring a little earlier so that you can, you know, start planting in March or even late February, depending where you live. But, you know, you can use a cold frame for, you know, get starting seedlings, which will then be dug up and transplanted to your garden. But you can also use them for overwintering, you know, half hardy perennials. Or if you love to force bulbs inside, and oftentimes, of course, many need a cold period, you can pot them up and put them in a cold frame for a couple of months until that cold period is up. So it's not just about growing vegetables. There are many uses for cold frames. So, mm -hmm. you know, if you're into alpine plants or different things like that, you can use them to shelter those over winter too. So lots of applications. But yeah, for the most part, I do use mine um, to get a jump start and extra, you know, an extra early one in spring as well as go later into fall and throughout winter we harvest. Um, but you know, a cold frame really, its whole job is to shelter plants from ice, snow, winter winds, you know, and, and even though it's a small little gizmo or a device, you know, it really does uh, take in a lot of solar energy and it heats up. Like today here, it is freezing. It is like, uh, it's minus 20 Celsius and I don't know what that is in Fahrenheit. I just know it's really cold. Um, but the temperature in my cold frame out there now, I checked this morning, it's just above freezing. And I mean, that's amazing wow. to me that it's sunny here today and therefore the temperature inside the frame is just above freezing. So that's the whole job of a cold frame, to create a microclimate around your plants and start those seeds earlier um, and harvest earlier and harvest out of season. So that's the main, I think, okay. um, the way most of us are going to use a cold frame. Okay. So in this 101, maybe we start with where is a good place to site a cold frame relative to sun and buildings and blah, blah, blah. Where's a good place? And do I dig it into the ground? You know what I mean? Like how big, you know, the basic sort of engineering before we get started building, scoping it out. Yeah, I think planning is definitely going to, you know, work in your favor before you just either order a cold frame online or you decide to go out and grab the materials. You know, start by thinking about it. There's two main parts, of course, the box or the frame, uh, and then the top, which is also called the sash. And so those are the two main components of a cold frame, and they can be made from lots of different materials, and I'll, I'll talk about that in just a sec. Um, but, you know, I, I think, as you mentioned, siting it is important. And when I first put my cold frames in, oh my gosh, probably 18 years ago, the first frames I had, I put them in the part of my backyard where the snow always melted first because I thought, well, obviously that's a bit of a microclimate. It was a very slight, you know, south facing slope and the snow just always melted first there. So that's where I sunk my cold frames. Um, and I did sink them down into the soil and I built them from untreated local hemlock and they were each three by six feet and I had three of them at the time. And my gosh, I got a, a lot of use out of those three cold frames. They were just my winter food factories. That's how I've always kind of thought of them. And that was sort of my one of my introductions into really using different season extenders. So I love cold frames. I think they deserve a place in every garden. Um, you know, even my garden, which is a big garden. And even though I have a polytunnel now, I still use my cold frames. And, I, you know, I have portable ones. I have permanent ones. I use them for lots of things. So materials you, you asked about as well. Wood, I think, is probably the most common material if you're going to build a cold frame. I use untreated hemlock, as I mentioned, but you can use cedar or other types of lumber. Um, you know, you can also use bricks or cinder blocks. Um, you know, there's so many different types of things you can use for them. But also polycarbonate. A lot of people are buying cold frames and they're made from polycarbonate, the box. And while it's not as insulating as wood, they certainly have their place. And you can do things, a few tricks to make them a little, maybe a little more insulating. Or even straw bales. My gosh, can any gardener have enough straw? No. <laughs> so I often buy like 20 or 30 or more um, straw bales in the fall. And I pile them in my shed and in the back of my polytunnel for winter. But I also use some of them for straw bale cold frames. Super quick. You know, in the, in the spring, that straw is maybe a little bit partially starting to rot. And then I can use it to make straw bale beds for squash and zucchini and things like that. So you can make the frame from lots of things. And then the sash, you know, people use old windows, which is great, but, you know, they can break. You know, I had a neighbor that always used yeah. windows for her cold frames. I, invariably, one would break over the winter and you'd be picking glass out of the soil, which is just not fun, um, especially when your lettuce is peppered with little glass splinters. You don't really necessarily want to eat that. So uh, I prefer using polycarbonate. I've also turned old windows. I've knocked the glass out of them and then um, stapled thin polyethylene, polyethylene material to the top and bottom to make an instant sort of cold frame top that's unbreakable. You can do that too. Then it's double insulated. But polycarbonate uh, is probably my favorite material for the top. Okay. Um, so the sash, the lid, whatever we want to call it, should it be tilted 
so so in other words, should the back of the frame where the hinge the hinged part of the sash is, should that be higher than the front part that where the maybe where there's a fastener or something like that? Do you know what I mean? Yeah, it totally should. You should have an angle in your cold frame. Um, you know, the wooden ones I started with were 18 inches tall at the back, 12 inches tall at the front. So okay. They, you know, had that little six inch uh, differential. And, and I sunk them in the ground about six inches as well, just for a little bit of extra insulation. And I thought those worked fantastic. Um, you know, basically you do want to have uh, an angle in your cold frame because it's going to capture more solar energy and you want them to face, as I mentioned, towards the South. So they do get a lot of sunlight, even in winter when that, you know, the winter sun is so low in the sky, like right now, it just kind of up here in Nova Scotia, it just grazes the horizon. But Ugh. I get, it's still enough though, that, uh, you know, my cold frames are warming up in the day. So you know, it, you, you just need to find a place where they get that sun. Definitely have them at an angle. And I've seen some where they're two feet tall at the back and one foot at the top or, you know, in the front, sorry. So it's quite a steep angle. It doesn't have to be super steep, um, but you definitely want to have some angle. So you do capture as much light as possible. Okay. I would imagine also that the snow melts and drips all, do, do you know what I mean? It might yeah. help with, with that, like the way that a roof is pitched. Do, do you know what I mean? Yes, yeah, snow yeah. shedding and rain shedding and all that. Cause of course we get rain, you know, and then if, overnight it's going to freeze. And if yeah. you're, if the roof is sloped, it's going to, to, to run off much easier for sure. And same with snow. If it's a light snow, it'll slip off easier. Um, you know, I do go up there. I have like a little broom and I, I brush it off when it snows. And, you know, I try to do that, you know, at this point we don't get snow as much as we used to 20 years ago. Um, um, but if we do get a snow out there, I knock it off the tops. Now, sometimes in February, we're in the middle of that, you know, that deep freeze of winter. And I just have something like carrots in a cold frame. I don't even bother to take the snow off because really they're not growing. They're just sitting in there waiting for me to harvest them. So it's not as important for me to make sure the light is getting into that cold frame uh, for, for the root crops versus the salad greens, like the spinach or the lettuce or the arugula, where they're still slowly growing and they still need that, uh, that solar energy to warm up the interior of the frame during the day. So I always make sure I brush the snow off those frames. But if I just have a carrot cold frame, the snow is extra insulation. So I don't mind that sometimes. So you just said extra insulation and sometimes, and this is where my friend, my, my neighbor, Paul, who actually did get in touch with me to ask me. Um, <laughs> hi, Paul. <laughs> yeah. Hi, Paul. So he, it, because he, he, this was his first year with these wonderful new cold frames that he built and he's been enjoying, enjoying, enjoying. And as you said a few couple minutes ago, you know, we have d a different weather pattern. It doesn't get cold as early as it did and it's not as severe and so forth. And so we're just about to have our first serious cold this week while we're taping, which is mid to late December. And, and um, so he wanted to stretch it and stretch it a little more. And he was like, what can I do? Do I cover it? Do I, you know, what can I do? And do I put heating cables in it? And do I, oh my goodness, what should I do? You know, he was a light bulb he read about somewhere. And so, <laughs> you know what I mean? I mean, yeah. it, so what about that? Do you cover them or what do you, you just said snow insulation? Yeah, there's lots of options. So if he's growing, like, I mean, some people do put heating cables in the soil of their cold frame, um, usually before they're planted, of course, because right. you want that to be sunk down into the soil. But that is something you can totally do. You can also hang, you know, a little incandescent lights in there as well. I've done that in my mini hoop tunnels. In a cold frame, it's a little harder where it's a lower profile. You don't want um, the lights hitting. Uh, the, if it's a polycarbonate top, you don't want them bumping up against that. You also don't want them touching the food crops. So if there's not a lot of space in there, it can be kind of hard to do. Um, you know, often people use heat sinks. So they will take, you know, milk jugs or water jugs, one gallon jugs, or even, you um, well, I would call it a two liter pop bottle, but I guess I'm not sure what that would be in the imperial system, probably like half a gallon pop bottle mm -hmm. or soda bottle. And you can paint that black or your milk jugs black and fill them with water and put them inside. And during the day when it's sunny, they're going to absorb heat. And then during the night, they will release some of that heat, just, you know, preventing huge temperature swings. So it just more moderates the temperature inside your cold frame at night. Um, you know, for my polycarbonate cold frame, I do have one that's top and, and sides polycarbonate. It's not nearly as insulating as my wooden cold frames. But I take those polycarbonate cold frames and I put leaves or straw around the, the perimeter of them just to, to bulk it up. Um, in winter, the top is still open and clear. So people, you know, or so the sun can still get inside, but you can also put evergreen boughs around the outside of them too, for that extra insulation. So you're taking a, something that maybe is more like a three season cold frame, 
and turning it into a four season cold frame. Okay. Um, some people paint the interiors of their cold frames white to reflect extra light. Some people put heavy duty aluminum foil in the inside of them along the sides to help again, reflect more light in. So there's lots of tricks you can do. Um, but for the most part, I, I will use some heat sinks in mine. Um, but you know, and I will use insulating materials. Like if I have a carrot cold frame, Right now, one of my polycarbonate cold frames is filled with carrots. And I went up yesterday before the temperature dipped, and I filled it with some shredded leaves and straw, just for extra insulation. I mean, again, those carrots aren't growing now, so having the, the insulating leaves and straw on top just helps prevent the, the soil from deep freezing. Okay. Okay. Um, so on the other end of the season, Ooh. you got a box with a lid, and it gets hot in there in the summer. <laughs> It, so we yeah. have to have a venting plan, right? Now, what, you know, just like a greenhouse has venting and in, 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 in the case of greenhouses, usually fans and so forth to move out excess heat, not just, you know, keep cold in, it, you know, I mean, not just a heating system to prevent cold. Um, what do we do about that in a cold frame, the venting? Are there automated uh, hinges and stuff that you use or what do you do? You can totally get automated hinges, but since I work from home, I just generally, if the temperature is going to be over 40 or about four degrees Celsius, I just go up and I prop them open. Um, some of the polycarbonate ones you buy, just, you know, they have the top, you can kind of slide and then it's a screen. Um, so oh. it's, it's very easy and convenient. You can do that, or you can prop it open with like a, a little wood prop, or you can buy automatic vent openers um, that, you know, once the temperature reaches a certain threshold, they, they open a couple inches or more. You can do that as well. Um, and I fully expect, even though I know it's, you know, mid late December, I'll probably still vent from time to time because, you know, our winters are, don't just stay cold all the time now. And, you know, if it's going to be late December and all of a sudden it's above freezing and we're getting a rain, I'll open those cold frames just to give them a watering. It's super uh, right. convenient convenient to do as well. Now, some of my, my old frames that I had, um, the wooden ones that I would use, I would often unscrew the hinges and store them in the summertime. Um, but this past summer, I left a couple on and I kept them half propped open and I grew melons in my cold frames in summer thinking <laughs> the little bit of extra heat might help. And it did. I had so many amazing melons this summer and it's purely because I grew them in cold frames. <laughs> That's so funny. Um, I, I just was talking to a friend who's an estate gardener um, for a big place in um, kind of near West Point, New York. And he was saying that the property has all these old cold frames, but they're no longer in serviceable condition. You know, the glazing, the lids, right. the glasses. But he, um, when he came to the property, he used one for one row to plant asparagus in. So it's like this hilarious, you know, it's still this sense of the old architecture, you know, of a classical estate garden, you know, with the, yeah. and, and with this wonderful, these ferny asparagus <laughs> coming out of it. But like you say, you know, you could use them for something else as of an course. extra bed, so to speak, without the lid. Yeah. Yeah. And I was in Mount, uh, I was at, uh, that doesn't seem like just last year, it seems like 10 years ago now, but I was at Mount Vernon uh, in Washington, uh, just outside Washington last year. Yes. Uh, and, and, I, you know, they have cold frames there as well that are not really in serviceable condition right now, uh, usable condition, I should say, but they are beautiful structures. Um, and you can still see, you know, how useful they are, even though they're, you know, the tops are a little broken and stuff. There's still things growing inside and it's coming up like it was coming up like crazy uh, in early spring. So it's quite beautiful. Yeah. Um, I think for some of the uses that you were, so we were talking about dimensions earlier and I'm just going to backtrack yeah. for a second. So, you know, we were talking about like yours are... 12 on the low end and 18 on the back what, what yep. you, yeah. three feet by six feet and then 18 at the, at the back and 12 at the front and then I also right. have polycarbonate ones that are three feet by two feet right so obviously you would go taller on both the front and the back sides if you were going to make them very deep in the ground some people like to go very deep in the ground or if you are going to like you talked about forcing bulbs or whatever or overwintering tender things sometimes if those are woody things and those things are going to be you know what i mean if you want to Absolutely. tuck away stuff that's two feet tall or three feet tall you know so another design variation is if if you're going to use them for storage of things as opposed to some of these other uses we've been talking about um you might want them deeper you know if you Absolutely. want the versatility yeah but yeah, but for, for sure. yeah, but for general purposes, like you've been talking about, uh, what have you been harvesting recently from them? 
Oh my gosh. Um, well, so in a sort by sort of frames now, there's like four scattered around the garden. Um, I like to grow because again, they're not super tall. My frames, you've got about, depending on the frame, 12 to 18 inches, uh, height inside. So for the most part, I like to grow, um, compact crops. So Vates blue curled Scotch kale is so delicious and wow. it's so beautiful and it only grows about 12 or 14 inches tall. So it's the perfect cold frame, uh, salad crop for winter, but also, you know, my favorite mosh. I love mosh and mizuna and mustards, all the different colors and textures, um, winter lettuces, winter density, North Pole, winter wonderland. Uh, it's, it's wonderful how many varieties of winter hardy lettuces there are now, the Salanova types. So I, I would say if you're interested in growing some of them into winter, you know, don't just buy the traditional ones you'd have for summer. Look for some of these more winter hardy lettuces because they right. uh, last year I, I did a test of them and most of them went all winter long with no extra protection other than the cold frame. It was great. And um, did you sow those direct into the frames or did you start them somewhere and transplant them? Oh, yeah. What? For yeah. winter lettuces, um, I do start them indoors under my grow lights and okay. then I transplant them out when they're like about two inches tall. It really gives them a nice head start indoors when, you know, it's still hot in September when they're transplanted um, okay. in mid to late September. So I like to give them that that little head start indoors and it helps. Okay. But things like mosh and mizuna is direct sown. Uh, spinach is direct sown and arugula, which I'm harvesting now, all that's direct sown. Uh, tatsoi, claytonia. Generally, I really only give like the kales and the winter lettuces a head start inside and the other salad crops are direct sown. And and of course, so are the root crops, carrots, beets, parsnips, winter radishes. They're all direct sown too. scallions, things like that. Mm -hmm. You just said Claytonia. I think the common name of that, I think, is miner's lettuce. Is that right? Yeah. Miner. It, what does yeah. it taste like? I've, I've never grown it. It tastes like spring. That's <laughs> how so I like to describe it. It's a bit succulent, you know. It's got these small, beautiful leaves that are kind of almost diamond shaped, but mature so that they're almost like a water lily. They encircle the stem with a tiny little flower as well towards the end of winter. Um, but they have that fresh taste of spring greens, you know, which is, I think, why it's called miner's lettuce during the California gold rush. Um, it was one of the first greens to come up that was then, of course, harvested and eaten in, as a salad green and helped ward off scurvy. So um, it's I don't lovely want scurvy. This has been a bad enough year. <laughs> yeah, I'm I can't sorry. deal with scurvy right now. Okay? Just <laughs> let's be clear. <laughs> Just say no to scurvy. <laughs> Eat your greens. <laughs> yeah. So in the last yeah. few minutes, I wanted to just ask you back to double back to the book. So what's of all you have everything. I mean, you're just the woman <laughs> with everything up there. You've got you've tried all these, you know, again, for, I said in the intro from cloches to, you know, full on polygenals. I mean, where do you find sounds like the cold frames are some of your tried and true companions that that help you. But what where else? What other devices, you know, you're really recommending or excited about or whatever? I mean, it can be super simple. Like, you know, you don't have to go and buy anything. You know, if somebody has a bed of carrots or parsnips or beets or other types of hardy crops like leeks, I mean, in late fall, you can dump shredded leaves or straw right on top of that bed and harvest all winter, you know, so you don't have to spend money to extend your season and use garden covers like this. Um, you know, 2020 has brought a lot of things, including a, a garden boom. And here in Nova Scotia and beyond, I'm hearing from so many gardeners that did put in a bigger structure this year. You know, for years they've been saying, oh, I wish I had a greenhouse or a polytunnel. And this is the year they said, I'm doing it. And honestly, hundreds of letters and, and texts I've gotten from people, yeah. um, polytunnels, greenhouses, even geodesic domes. Um, you know, and in the book, I talk about how to use those. Maybe you want to grow vining cucumbers or melons in those in the summer. I, you know, I've, I've got lots of info on how you do that. Or maybe you're going to grow peppers, you know, in a northern climate and tomatoes in your structure. And, you know, pruning them or training them to one or two stems, it can be so much more productive for you. So I, I talk a lot about, you know, the little tricks like that as well. It's not just... Let's grow tomatoes in our greenhouse. Well, how can we get the best crop, you know, reduce diseases and pests um, and just harvest a bumper crop of delicious tomatoes? So I think there's a lot of considerations we often don't think about when we're growing undercover. And I wanted to take the guesswork out of that for people, for sure. Uh, across the river from uh, across the Hudson River from me, Lee Reich, um, the gar another garden writer, Hi. long time. And he has a, 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 you know, like a greenhouse, but it's a poly, a poly house. And he keeps it at 36 in the winter degrees Fahrenheit because he loves figs and he has fig trees in there. And that's all it takes for him in, 
you know, the very cold zone five, whatever, yep. to have reliable crop. And then on the floor, in the ground, beneath them and around them, he grows all what you just talked about, all the <laughs> winter greens and so on and so forth. So, I mean, you know, if you have a passion for something like you want a fig tree and you're not in a place, well, you could do that. <laughs> well, you know, and figs are big here. We have a Canadian fig expert for cold climate, Stephen Biggs, and he has inspired me and he, and he also has enabled me because he keeps sending me cuttings. So I have put figs in my polytunnel. It's not heated though, um, but I right. insulate them with straw and stuff. And I mean, I have artichokes in there and they overwinter for me fine, but I deep mulch them with straw in late fall. But it's very tempting, Margaret, to think about maybe getting another polytunnel uh -oh. and marginally heating it so I can have a fig forest. Because again, my husband's Lebanese and, you know, and so many of the vegetables and things I grow are, you know, are for his family. Yes, and yes, figs yes. are a big part of that. <laughs> well, Nikki Jabor, the new book is Growing Undercover. We're going to have a book giveaway with the transcript of the show on awaytogarden.com. I'm, I, I, I'm so appreciative of this called Frame 101. Thank you, thank you, and I'll talk to you again soon. I can't wait. Thank you, Margaret. Okay. Have a great day. <laughs> Programming and underwriting support from Brushwood Nursery. For more than 20 years, Brushwood Nursery has shipped the finest selection of clematis and other vines all over the United States with full gallon-sized plant and free shipping. Their website is full of beautiful pictures and information on growing clematis. BrushwoodNursery.com. Programming and underwriting support from Garden Tool Company. Garden Tool Company's wide selection of heirloom quality, quality tools for your gardening passion is backed by outstanding customer service, fast shipping, and ongoing support. GardenToolCompany.com. And I'll talk to all the rest of you again soon, I hope, too. Now, don't miss an episode. You can subscribe free to the podcast version of the show on Stitcher or iTunes or Spotify. And you can find me anytime at AwayToGarden.com or on Facebook and on Instagram as at Away to Garden. Happy gardening meantime. Away to Garden with Margaret Roach is a joint production of AwayToGarden.com and the smallest NPR station in the nation, Robin Hood Radio. Mm -hmm.